Hi, I'm Omni Sunday. In this video, we're going to talk about senescence, which is the process of deteriorating function of an organism with age. As someone who recently turned 20, I'm very qualified to talk about this. Basically, have one more decade before I turn to dust. Not really. I'm hoping to have lots of decades ahead of me. Speaking of, not many other animals can say the same. And in this video, I'll talk about animals specifically. The senescence of other stuff like plants is a whole different subject. Senescence can be measured in large amounts by increasing death rates and decreasing fertility as something gets older, meaning if it's more common for someone to die at 70 than it is for them to die at 20, and the former doesn't have as many babies as the latter, it probably has to do with senescence. Like I said, that measurement really only works in large amounts and not at all in an individual. Just because I haven't had any kids at 20 or ever doesn't mean I'm senescing because I haven't been as fertile as most people my age, or never senescing because I've technically never decreased in fertility. Same goes for if I die at 30, that doesn't mean I was senescing really fast or that my death had anything to do with senescence. For an individual, you define it simply by stuff not working anymore. Some examples would be slowed responses to stuff, higher chances of getting sicknesses like cancer and heart disease, and chronic inflammation. The last one just means their immune system is out of whack, everything's getting puffy, and it's unstoppable. Senescence seems to be the default in animal life, but it doesn't always end in death. Well, it does, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Senescence isn't always a death sentence. Exhibit A is the phoenix jellyfish, known for being biologically immortal. It's misunderstood though, and doesn't exactly just live forever with nothing to stop it. They start their lives in a larval form that swims in the water like the average cnidarian, then develop into polyps. In the case of the phoenix jellyfish, this stage is terrestrial, or more accurately, aerial. They swim in the air with some weird magic, but their life cycle isn't magic. The polyps have branches and are connected to the ground with something called a stolon. At the end of each branch, there's a bud which grows something called a medusa, which is the recognizable jellyfish phase of the organism. All these medusas are genetically identical to the polyp, which catches bugs and stuff from the air. Once the medusa is fully grown, it'll disconnect from the polyp to float freely in whatever weird cave it lives in. The medusa can reproduce sexually to make more of those larvae, but there's more to it. When the medusa is sick, old, or damaged somehow, it can actually turn back into a polyp. From there, it can continue to make genetically identical medusas. It's technically immortal in that way since the new medusas are genetically identical to the original, but it would be like if you turned into a bunch of genetically identical babies. They're not really you anymore and wouldn't know what you know even if they do grow up to look just like you. Jellyfish don't have a brain though, so their sense of self is less important, I guess. But there's more ways to avoid senescence. The tunitar isn't biologically immortal, but it has extreme resilience through something called cryptobiosis. They can stop their metabolism, allowing their entire body to dehydrate as they draw their legs and head into their shell and just wait. They can survive this way without eating for decades, possibly centuries. They can survive extreme temperatures, pressures, and lack of oxygen as well. Then when they're rehydrated and back in a comfy environment, they can just go back to how they were before. They're not quite extremophiles though, because their chances of dying increase the longer they endure stuff like this. They don't take advantage of the extreme conditions, they just survive them. The last example of a thing that sort of avoids senescence isn't technically an animal, but I figure it's worth talking about. Senescence happens when cells age, but if you're constantly growing and replacing old cells with new ones, that doesn't happen. The elder puff is an extreme example of this. We can see examples of them in different stages of life, but they grow so slowly that over a hundred years there's barely a difference in the known specimens. It's unknown whether they've always been like this or if they used to grow faster somehow. Judging by the current growth rate, assuming it hasn't changed, the largest specimens could be up to 7,000 years old. Who knows if it senesces or how, but a thousand years is certainly an impressive amount of time to not senesce. Different animals senesce at different rates, even if they aren't immortal. For example, a pipsqueak is sexually mature at around 6 months old and tends not to live much longer than 2 years. A king dragon, though, is mature around 16 years old and can live up to 30 years. There are even big differences in sapient species. For example, new shoes might finish growing in their early 30s and die of old age in their 60s, whereas a human could finish growing in their 20s and die of old age well after 100. However, a new shoe is usually in their prime from their 30s to their 50s, with much more experience than a human who is in their prime in their 20s and slowly deteriorates after. 
In this video, I want to talk about the senescence of different groups of animals and how or why that might have evolved. I want to start with newtias. Like I said, they slowly grow until their early 30s and are in their prime till their 50s. Males tend to die of organ failure in their 60s, but females can live up to 100 years. Many dragons have similar sorts of aging, though sexual dimorphism that stark is rare. Basically, they grow really slowly and are really powerful for a while until they quickly deteriorate. This is influenced by their hormones, which beef up their muscles and oxygen and everything until they burn out. To understand this life cycle better, let's learn about a super extreme example that actually isn't even a dragon, so it evolved this trait separately. They're called the dead man's redfish. They look like relatively normal fish for most of their life, which is about five years in the open ocean. Once they reach sexual maturity though, they trek through rivers and waterfalls to reach the stream they were spawned in. During this trek, they go through some really weird changes. Their body is flooded with corticosteroids, increasing metabolism, blowing up their muscles, spiking stress levels, and putting them through a crazy metamorphosis. After they spawn, if they're not immediately eaten, they age extremely quickly and will rot alive. Why would something like this evolve? Well, it has a name. Semel parity is a reproductive strategy that's basically defined by putting everything you have into re reproducing one time, trading off future opportunities. It's consisted by heteroparity, meaning you reproduce many times in your life. They're sort of on a continuum from one to another, with the dead man's redfish probably being on the extreme of semel parity. How does something like that evolve? Let's think about how evolution works in the first place. It's not an intelligent process, it sort of just works based on what can survive to reproduce. That's what makes the evolution of aging so interesting, since evolution kind of doesn't care what happens after you survive to reproducing age. Obviously it does if you can keep reproducing afterward, but sometimes that's not even the case. More of that in a bit though. Semel Paris critters have an extremely synchronized mating cycle, sometimes down to the day. It probably has to do with available food, so there can be as much energy for the babies as possible. That means food during a breeding season all the way through to when the babies are actually born or hatched. Basically, a semel paris critter will put all its eggs in one basket in one season, maybe even one day. It can work really well in optimizing everything for a ton of babies, but obviously the big trade-off is future chances in case the one goes wrong, and if you're sentient, it probably sucks to die so soon. Semel parity is super rare in tetrapods, unless we're talking about dragons. True semel paris dragons that only breed once and die right after aren't exactly common, but many dragons have those sort of tendencies, specifically males. Just as a reminder, there are two separate lineages of dragons that we know of. There are insectoid dragons and archosaurian dragons. I'm talking about archosaurian dragons since those are tetrapods, but many insects are semel paris as well. Archosauria has two main lineages, with Pseudosuchia generally having more semel paris tendencies than Ava metatarsalia. Of Aevimetatarsalia though, Pterosauria has much more of those tendencies than Dinosauria. It might just be that dragons are likely to evolve that sort of thing for some reason, or that semel parity is a basal trait to them and dinosaurs are just more derived. Nishus are Pseudosuchians, so they have a lot of semel paris traits like I said. They evolve for a lifestyle like that to some degree, where they focus all their fertility on one small region of time. Males evolve this way, but females don't have the same supercharge of hormones, so they can focus on raising their young. There's evidence that close relatives of Nushu such as Onyuo are more extreme, with females living more than three times longer than males. It's likely to be less so with Nushu because the males were more useful in raising their babies as they became more social and more intelligent. Still, the stress of their ancestors will quickly deteriorate half of all Nushu before they reach the age of 70. First their sight goes, then as their mind goes, so does their liver, kidneys, heart, and even their skin will begin to rot in the latest stages before death. A dying old man has a very distinct smell, as many people know from experience. Next, I want to talk about some mammals. Most mammals have hair, which is usually some shade of brown thanks to a pigment called melanin. Like I've established, old age comes with a lot of things not working, and for mammals, one of those things is whatever process puts melanin in hair. So a fun way to tell if a mammal is old is to look at their hair and see if it's white or lighter than before. This doesn't always work because depending on how they senesce, other things might stop working before the hair thing, but it's a neat feature. Some non-mammals also go gray as they age, the most relevant I can think of being new shoes, 
but those are actually for a different reason. And Yushu's hair going gray actually has more to do with sexual selection and is something of a way to show that the individual is an adult. Anyway, mammals usually have hair as their sort of armor, similar to scales in some reptiles and an exoskeleton in most arthropods. Many mammals have thick skin as armor, but a lot of the time it's thin enough that gravity does a number on it after many decades, causing wrinkles and sagging. Some animals are naturally wrinkly though, as it can provide some benefits related to surface area and making them harder to grab. The biggest difference though between mammals and other animals is that most mammals have a placenta. They feed their babies inside them in something like a soft muscular egg, then give birth to a full-blown baby when ready. It's usually a terribly painful and dangerous process, especially as intelligence goes up and brains get bigger. For example, Pseudosians have the largest brain-to-body size ratio of any sapient species. Their sister species, Sporovi, have even bigger brains, but also bigger bodies, though they do have the same problem I'm about to tell you. Their babies are born very underdeveloped, but still have a very large head with a big old brain cooking in there. Their skull has a lots of openings in there though, to allow it to go through the birth canal and allow for more growing, so they have squishy heads till at least the age of 6. What does this have to do with senescence? The point I'm trying to illustrate is that birth is very hard, and it already has low success rates in perfectly healthy individuals, but now imagine how bad it is if the person giving birth is elderly. It's important that very few births happen when someone is old, especially in a species like Pseudosians, because it gives us insight into their evolution. Lots of weird things happen as we age, and it's especially interesting in the context of evolution because natural selection should have weaker influence as critters age. The mystery of why critters live past the age they can reasonably reproduce might have to do with the likelihood that they can help other critters reproduce, or it might just be good luck that they didn't evolve to senesce quickly to allow others that can reproduce to eat. Of course, it could be both of those at the same time, plus more things I can't even think of. I also want to talk about arthropods which are interesting in their own way when it comes to senescence. Most don't live very long, but many will continue growing throughout life. For example, long ago there was a widespread conception of the common lobster and the great lobster. As animal studies and observation became more known, common lobsters were able to be observed for living for decades and growing to huge sizes. In reality, while the common lobster is sexually mature, it never stops growing and can become a great lobster in a few decades. How does senescence factor in here? Well, even if the lobster is growing, it has to molt each time, meaning it sheds its huge exoskeleton and has to grow another to fit its body. Even though the lobster usually eats its molts, it still takes weeks to restore a huge exoskeleton like that before it sheds it again in a year anyway. It may be faster without a shell, but it's incredibly vulnerable. A great lobster has always been rare, but nowadays they're only found and grown in captivity. As it grows, it also may be too large for its body because of the square cube law. As its height, width, and length grow, because its proportions stay mostly the same, its mass grows exponentially. For example, a cube growing 4 times the height actually grows 8 times the weight. Not only does this cause problems with the heat retention, it also could make the lobster crush itself under its own weight. It may be underwater, but that shell is very fucking heavy. It also has much more of a food requirement, which is often how the great lobster meets its end. The oxygen requirement is also a big problem, but they do grow strange gills to aid in that as they get bigger. Basically, my point in all this is that senescence isn't just aging as we know it. As the shell gets heavier and the lobster gets slower, it becomes harder for the lobster to get food and easier for it to become food. Like I established earlier, senescence can be defined by critters becoming less likely to reproduce and more likely to die, so even though someone could argue that the great lobster is better than the common lobster, it can't be denied that it's further on in senescing. Before I go, I want to show this amazing van art by Knight Elkwarden, showing a mother Nushu's having a conversation with a mother Imari, the latter of which is a dragon from their world. It's such cool art, and I feel incredibly lucky to get fan art like this. It means the world to me that someone cares enough about my world to spend time drawing some of it. If you want to check Knight Elkwarden out, their Tumblr is in the description. And that's all I got for this video. I've only scratched the surface of senescence, but I talked about what I wanted to talk about and myself learned a lot while recording the video. If you'd like to, check out my Patreon to support me and get your name within my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop, Art of Dying, and Mr. Kill. 
Good luck to everyone on your senescence, and thanks for watching.